I think. Hello, everybody. YouTube says we're live. I believe it. Thank you so much for being here. Glad you're hanging out with us on a wonderful Wednesday evening. Hope you are enjoying your day. Uh, today, we got things to talk about after I fix all the electronics. Uh, we are going to be talking about snails today a little bit. Not We're not going to spend a bunch of time on it. We're actually going to have probably a lot of time to answer your questions. Just like last week, Joanna's only going to be here for the first half because she's got to go get the little one. He's not so little anymore. He'll always uh, be the little one. He'll always be the little one, even though right? he's six one. Yeah. And I guess he's technically okay. the tallest. He's the biggest one in the house at this point in he terms is. of height. So. Yeah. But you know how it is if you've got kids. The little one is always the little one. So <laughs> that is absolutely true. Thank you so much for hanging out with us, for being here tonight. Uh, we'll have a small giveaway at some point as well. So just wanted to uh, make that known. It wasn't anything I put in the title because I just wanted you to know, hey, there's going to be a small giveaway tonight. And you know what it is. I do. I'm looking you at it right it there. Right off camera in the right secret there. location right there. Oh, yeah, it's going to happen. So anyway, yeah, that's the dealio there. Uh, let's see what else is happening. Uh, just things that are happening in the world today and well, in the land of primetime aquatics and the small scape, that world, which is our world right now. Small world. Yeah, <laughs> it's a small, it's a small world. Uh, so videos that happen. Let's see. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. I did the update. On the fish room, there's some more to yeah. talk about there uh, in a little bit, but uh, that was fun. And we have made, believe it or not, we have made a ton of progress. What is today, Wednesday? Yes. Yeah, we've been doing a lot of work the last few days. I feel like it's, it's. I, I've been saying this for a while, but once we got past the, just the breakdown, empty tanks out, saw stands in half, get that stuff out of there. I did a little bit of straightening up. At least I swept Good. Right, I swept the ground. That's all I did. So, yeah, things are moving along. Yeah. <laughs> we did a lot more than that, or at least some more than that. And now the planning stages are really starting to happen. So, uh, so Sunday, yeah, if you haven't seen that video, it's been a little while since I shared the fish room. And I shared a, uh, a big, giant, huge mess. That's what I did. Yeah. And so today on the small scape, what did you talk about today? I talked about the mystery known as fall fish keeping. That's a thing? Yes. Is that a thing you basically just made up? No. I think so. Fall fish keeping. Shh. You know, people get back into the hobby and stuff, but there's some things you have to watch out for. Yeah. You know, I do want to say thank you to all of the people who were watching the live stream last week. None of you revealed the things that I said to my wonderful partner over here in the live stream. So, because I didn't get yelled at, I didn't get a talking to the entire week, which means... We had thousands of you, you know, on the, between live and, and the replay. You all kept your mouth shut. That's awesome. It's great to know that I no can blabbing? trust. I can trust thousands of people with Wait. a with a thing that I said. And what no, don't I? I still don't know whatever <laughs> you're talking about. Yeah, we're gonna keep it that way, oh, right, you, everybody? You mean after I left? Yep. Really? Yeah. So you like share things you don't tell me about after I leave? I did. I shared. I really shared. I might have overshared. And uh, thank you. Thank you for just, uh, it's awesome. <laughs> just shut <Yes>. it. <laughs> so, yeah. What stays in the primetime aquatics live stream or what, what's said in the primetime aquatics live stream stays in the live stream. Not really. Even though it's, it's a completely public live stream. Yeah, and I can just go watch it later. Nope, because I'm going to take it offline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, sure. Now I'm going to delete it. You'll never know what was he said. He wasn't kidding. He really did. Yeah. Wow, that was rude. Uh, so <laughs> snitches get stitches. Thanks, Whip. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's tell right. tell him, Whip. Yep. That's what happens. So anyway, I'm glad you you did something about fall fish keeping. So if you haven't seen that in the small scape, might as well check it out and see see what the dealio is. Uh, tomorrow, members, we've got some... I've got some things to show you. I've got... Obviously, I just mentioned that we had a bunch of stuff happen in the fish room. And of course, you're going to see... Uh, what's happened in the fish room because yeah it's been it's been pretty crazy so that's the dealio there and yeah. then Sunday we'll have a video out on for everybody uh, on primetime aquatics I haven't decided which one that's going to be just yet but I hope you enjoy it because I have lots of things going on in my brain of stuff that I need to, to share and so that's what's going to happen there so that's the land of videos 
I do want to say once again, thank you to everybody who came to the Greenwater Aquarius Society swap on Saturday. It was a weird thing on Saturday because we've been doing these swaps for a decent amount of time now, a number of years. And it was it was kind of crazy because the swap started at 10. It was one of those things where I was looking at Joanna right around 1040. I'm like, where's the crowd? Usually everybody just kind of piles in and it's a pretty busy place. Yeah. And after about 40 minutes, I was like, hmm. um, hmm. this could be a rough one. And then all of a sudden, 10 minutes later, the place was packed. So it was a little bit rainy uh, last Saturday around here. It was. But thank you to everybody who came out and and got all your fish and everything. And that leads me to this Sunday, we are going to be at the Greater Chicago Cichlid Association, otherwise known as the GCCA swap. And we've got lots of cool stuff already sold out of some fish on the website. So if you're thinking about going there, check out primetimeaquatics.com and we've got some fish there. And oh my gosh, do we have some, what I hope to be really awesome fish coming in. In the next couple of you days. You were totally excited. I was very excited. It was like it's, Christmas. Yeah. He was so excited. I a whole bunch of stuff that I have not seen in a long time, some stuff that I've been dying to get. And I if everything comes and it's very rare that, that happens where everything I want comes in. But if that happens, holy cow, it's going to be pretty darn cool. So I can't wait to share that with you. Uh, so yeah, we got the swap on Sunday. And then after that, we've got a couple weeks. But then, of course, we've got Aquashella Daytona. If you're going, leave that down in the chat because it's time to kind of celebrate, uh, get hyped up. Got to get hyped. And speaking of fall. We weren't speaking of fall. <laughs> I'm thinking of fall. I've got fall on the brain. It's one of the best seasons. Best. I was thinking we, I always forget whenever I get, because I'm, I'm on the email list, of course, with Flip, you know, Flip Aquatics. They are a channel sponsor, but... You know how much I love pumpkin shrimp. They are my favorite. Well, between pumpkin and the yellow shrimp, it's a really close tie. But anyways, he does have 25% off pumpkin. And I think there's there might be a couple others that are kind of like Halloween-esque um, shrimp. 25% off until like Saturday or Sunday. So I just These wanted guys. to share that because that's a, that's a pretty good chunk These of money. Guys. Yeah. I need more so, pumpkin shrimp in my life, I'm just saying. There you go. Here's one. Here's thank two. That's the pumpkin much. shrimp coffee mug. Mm-hmm. They're on Prime Tile yeah. Aquatics as well. And by the way, thank you because we are getting close to being gone on those too because we had some go at the swap and then more people ordered. So I think once those are gone, that's it yes. for the year, right? Correct. So that's if it. you want them, get them now because we're the ones that we brought in, it's like it's a special thing for this year, at mm-hmm. least this time of the year, yeah. and they're going to be gone once they're gone. Mm-hmm. So you that's, it. yeah, that's what's happening there. Uh, so Aquashella, yeah, it's coming up. It's So here's a funny story. Funny story, and then we're getting into the, the snails. I'm sitting there, or not sitting there, I got home from school today, mm-hmm. and we're talking, we just mentioned Aquashella. This one over here, my lovely wife says, man, I wonder if we could ride, take the motorcycles. Now, you have to know something about me. I will never turn an opportunity down to ride. No. I don't care if it's the beginning of November around here. I'm like, as we head south, it's going to be getting warmer and warmer and warmer. And then all of a sudden reality set in. And the reality is that when we leave, it's going to be after I get out of school. And we're not planning to get down to Tennessee until like 1, one thirty in the morning. And all of a sudden we're like, mm, maybe riding motorcycles in the beginning of November in areas we've never really ridden or driven before in that particular area is not the best idea. And then pulling up to a hotel at one o'clock in the morning, all tired. And then we'd have basically like a 700 mile day and then another, I don't know, 700 mile day. Yeah. And but what's no. worse is then we started thinking about on the way home, we always leave Sunday after the show ends. And we've got about a six or seven uh, hour trip right along kind of like the Florida panhandle and stuff on the way home. But absolutely no, we're not getting into the hotel until midnight there. And we're like, um... No. Yeah, that's probably not the best idea to to ride to yeah, was, take the motorcycles down kidding. to Daytona, but and then I, what? There's a hurricane coming. What? Oh, wait, dang it! <laughs> wait, there is. Oh, no, I was like, yeah, that would be doubly bad. Uh, yeah. That would be all kinds of holy cow. So yeah. that would be. Little Midwest says today I received my winnings from the primetime giveaway last week. Awesome. Already. Uh, thank Sweet. you, Whip, for your generosity of giving me your winnings. Next payday is plants and the <sighs> new tanks. New fish. That's Whip for you. Yeah, Mr. Awesome. Mr. 4720. Yep. 
Very cool. Very awesome. So anyway, that's uh, all the things that are going on. I did want to talk a little bit about, so we had a poll. Did you bring up Wait, the poll? Wait, before, before you get there, though, this is really funny. Speaking of whip, <laughs> Joanna, it's still very early, but I bought an Amazon sword from the dude on the corner by the chips and it's not dead yet. <laughs> From the dude on the corner by the chips. Oh, that's that's Steve, don't you think? Uh, right yes. across from the chips. Yeah, Steve List. Yeah, so yeah. you should have good luck with those plants, especially with the swaps. Most, especially green water. The people that are selling plants there, whether it's Steve or John Hornig, plants are absolutely insane. That's where we get a lot of our plants from too. Is when we need certain stuff. Just like grab them off the table at the swap, and we're ready to go. So anyway. Uh, poll results for yes, the. I have so them. I did a poll yesterday, and it was about basically. And by the way, it's not closed. You can continue to vote in the poll because sometimes I mention, like, man, I didn't see the poll. Just go onto the Primetime Aquatics page. There'll be a poll there. You can choose because it's fun to vote. So if you had, the question was if you had to be infested <laughs> with one type of snail, which one would you choose? And I gave pond snail, so like it's just your basic pest snail. The otherwise known as the bladder snail, the ram's horn snail, or the Malaysian trumpet snail. Yeah. What were the results? Or, or, or other. W- no. Or was it other? Or no, no. Duckweed. Oh, yeah, or duckweed. What were the results? All right, from from one to last place, first to last place, uh, ram's horn, number one. Yeah. Duckweed, number two. <laughs> that was my pick, by the way. Uh, number three is the trumpet snail, and bringing up the back is the pond snail. That's interesting. Yeah, I would have I, I would have thought I, I like so I just want to talk a little bit about so first of all, duckweed. Duckweed is actually and I probably should have stated this a little bit better when I did the video on how to get rid of duckweed, although I think I did mention it. If you've got an aquarium where you have a hang on back filter or a wave maker or something that's got pretty fast flow at the surface of the aquarium, you're not gonna have a duckweed problem. Even if duckweed gets into your tank, it has a really hard time surviving that flow. So just keep that in mind. True. Definitely out of the things that we pick, duckweed is the easiest to get rid of. I'm not saying it's easy, especially if you've got it in multiple tanks. But if you are meticulous and you take your time and you get out all the little duckweed, even with a net, it can be gone, right? There are decent numbers of fish that will eat it. So that's kind of cool. But then when it comes to snails, that was the real point of the question. I kind of thought that it would go ram's horn, bladder slash pond snails and, and Malaysian trumpet snails. And the reason I thought that is in terms of you know the infestation. So basically the least, the one people would want the least would be the Malaysian trumpet snail. That's kind of what I thought. Now, you don't like them. That's your least favorite, correct? I do not. Let's just say it very nicely. I do not like them at and, all. And why don't you not like They're them? They're gross. That's not really going to be very helpful to all of our wonderful viewers right now. They're gross. <laughs> I don't like them. Um well, I tend to like the darker substrates, although I am kind of balancing out with lighter substrates. You can just see them. And you know what? They're not cute like a regular little pond snail. I think that you can totally appreciate a little pond snail. They're kind of cute. Trumpet snails are not. Boo. Agree. Okay, I'd say out of the three, they are the least appealing. Although I do find them interesting looking just because of the way that their shells kind of form. Yeah. I will I will grant you the fact that they might be the least attractive out of the three snails. However, there is an advantage. And some people did a really good job of mentioning that in the comments when they were making their little comments for the poll. And that is- I disagree. Well, one, I know what you're they, say. Do, they do burrow. So you can't disagree on that, they do. Yes, I can. I see them all the time. Maybe you see some, but you don't see them all. They That's, do a better not... job of burrowing in sand. Now, obviously, the tanks where we have gravel, the larger the gravel is, the harder it's going to be for the Malaysian trumpet snails to kind of get in there. True. But for sand, for aquariums with sand, they will and do when the lights come on. They they kind of vanish. Right? For the most part, they will vanish. Now... So that's good. And some people mention, yeah, when they do that, they kind of stir up the substrate and all that stuff. And that can also be nice. So I agree with that. I think of them as little nighttime workers. They're a little nighttime working crew. And yes, I kind of feel bad for them because they don't get all that much love in the snail community, which today we're all part of the snail community. So probably because they're ugly and because out of all the snails we talk about, when it comes to an infestation, they, in my opinion, replicate the most rapidly, 
right? I mean, they really can overwhelm a tank in a hurry. All of them potentially can, but those in particular. And I think the other issue is how resilient the, the Malaysian trumpet snail is to all kinds of oh, things. Yeah. It's like, first of all, a lot of fish that you would see that eat snails, sometimes they will not eat the actual Malaysian trumpet snail. They'll eat pond snails. They'll eat ram's horn. And then like, oh, I don't want to eat these things. Maybe it's because they're ugly. I don't know. Yeah, like my uh, pea puffers. They yeah, they wouldn't them. eat them? They're like, those are, they, they had the same thinking as me. They're like, those are gross. But I will say there are a fair, so first of all, all African cichlids, in my opinion, will eat them because I make no effort to isolate duckweed or snails in the fish room. And if there are no snails or duckweed in an, a particular aquarium, it's because there's something in there eating that stuff. And what I have found is there are no Malaysian trumpet snails in any of our African cichlid tanks, even when there was for a short period of time. So at one point, we had the 40 gallon breeder. It's the same one where I did the um, the Brevis shell dweller species profile. Remember, there was a lot of them in there. And once those Brevis got, were in there, they were all gone. They ate them all. All of our shell dwellers ate all the Malaysian trumpet snails in the similis tank, in the multi tank. There's none, all African cichlid tanks. And most of the medium to larger size South and Central American tanks, there are none, right? Uh, the silver dollars eat them because there's none in that tank. Tinfoil barbs eat them. Ballast sharks will eat them. Uh, lots of loaches will eat them as well. So uh, they're gone there. I will also say, and maybe some of you have a different, and I was just going to say it, Christy. I was just going to say it. Our assassin snails don't like bladder snails. Uh, I have found that the assassin snails actually don't target the Malaysian trumpet snails as well either. And maybe it's, and they both burrow. So that's kind of an interesting thing because the assassin snails in the, in the substrate, they go too. They have a similar shaped shell. So I wonder if it's a camaraderie, you know. That's what it is. Yeah, they're all they just could hanging be out together. like a little oil. They're like, you know what, you're all right. Do you think go the ahead. Malaysian trumpet snails envy the assassin snails both for their attitude and the beauty of their shells? Probably. Yeah, they I think they do. They probably envy anybody, they even do. duckweed. By the way, before I forget, I do have a how to get rid of snails video. If, if that's just one of the way, that's just the way you roll. It is in the description of the live stream. So if you want to check that out. And I've done videos on Malaysian trumpet snails, how to care for them for those of you who actually want to have them in your aquarium. So there's those. The next thing on the list uh, in terms of popularity was the, the bladder or pond snail. I don't mind them, but to me those guys can really take off as well. And they're not oh, yeah. nearly as appealing looking as the ram's horn snail in my opinion, right? So, but you know what's weird? We haven't had those in the fish room in a really long time. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think we have a single one anywhere in any tank. Well, is that true? Do we have any back there? May, there might, or is there a ram's horn or two back? Hold on. Oh, I gotta turn around. Uh, no, I don't think we do. I thought at one point there might've been a couple ram's horn in these tanks. But mm. I don't see them anymore. But we used to have, and if you go back to the earlier videos, I mean, people would comment like, wow, uh, that's a nice snail collection you got there. And they were <laughs> mostly the, the, the pond snails. Yeah. And then over time, either the fish that we had in those tanks ate them. In some cases, we threw in assassin snails and they took care of it. And possibly they were getting outcompeted by ram's horn snails because that became the next thing in the fish room. And the one, if I had to choose... Personally, it would be the ram's horn snail for my infestation, mostly because I really do like their shells. I find them really interesting. And by the way, as they get larger, like usually around the people, some people don't realize they can get, we've had them as, as large as maybe the size of a nickel, right? Uh, and they get really True. pretty. And some of them actually have a, a pretty nice looking shell. They do. Right, in terms of the color. Mm -hmm. Now they can overrun a tank. So there, there's that. But which one would you pick as the one that you would want? Pond snail. So pond snail over the ram's horn? I think so. Okay. You're it's allowed your call, opinion. But yeah. you know. You're you're definitely allowed. So I do like the ram's horn. They don't they don't burrow like the, the Malaysian trumpet snail, unfortunately. They're gonna be out and about, and for those of you who have ever had a problem with them, you know wow, that can be a problem. Somebody mentioned something, and I know that you mentioned it at one point too, when feeding puffers, you you prefer the ram's horn snail. Mm -hmm. Why? Um, oh, <laughs> go ahead. Tell everybody. Oh. These are fish well, keepers here. Yeah. yeah. This took me a while too. It was like, oh, because you have to like kind of squish up the shell so they can, yeah. you know. For some pea puffers, they were My pea puffers were not like most pea puffers. They, they were, were high shy. Maintenance. 
they were they were very shy. They wouldn't. Um, yeah, they they needed a lot of hand holding. Yep. So <laughs> in that respect, yeah, it was a little bit easier to just like yeah. like crush up the the shell a little bit so they could eat a little bit more efficiently. So <sighs> I think their shells are definitely the easiest to crack. And definitely when you're accidentally stepping on them on the ground, those are the ones that crush under your feet. For your safety video, I was going to tell you, you forgot to say, wear shoes in your fish room. You know, that would have, that actually is... Because I thought about Yeah, I, I wish I would have mentioned that. because should have. That would have made it failed. a really great video if you would have... Yeah, now it's just subpar. Yeah, so I <laughs> did the aquarium safety video a couple weeks ago. And that is that is definitely something to consider is wearing shoes... Yeah. Well, you know what though? Yeah, if you've got a fish room like we do, that's probably important. But if we go back to normalcy and you've only got a couple two tree tanks, hmm? I don't think it's normalcy. as important. True. You know, because it's not like there's as much potential for things to be on the ground. In our fish room, it's a guarantee mm -hmm. that stuff is going to be on the ground. So we have our fish room slides uh, that we have down there just because, you know, random pieces of little rocks and driftwood and somebody's cleaning a tank and they, oh my gosh, how many of you have ever stepped on? Like there are like a top four things that you don't want to step on in the fish room, right? I mean, Dragonstone oh, yeah. has got to be near the top. And the smaller the pieces, the worse it is. Oh yeah, it's like a Lego. Right, so small, it's every bit a Lego. So small pieces of of Dragonstone. Mm -hmm. And say Ryu would be right up there too. They're both pretty sharp. Sp uh, Spiderwood, not fun. Right, so be better than bonsai, though. Yeah, but well, the only the only nice thing about bonsai is usually it has like kind of like that tree shape to it. Mm -hmm. So when you step on it, because there are so many pieces, it's like walking on a bed of nails. In theory, where it in does theory. still hurt, but it's not quite as bad as the spider would. When you, especially those smaller pieces that don't want to give. Oh yeah. Oh, that hurts so bad. Yeah. Uh, snail shells, especially like the the shells that we use, the escargot shells that we use oh. for. The shell dwellers. That's bad. Yeah, you step on those, that really hurts. But do you know if you step on something, it'll scare you. It, I'll do this, and it scares crap out of me, but it's, it's totally fine. It's a plant. <laughs> you step on a plant, and it scares Sometimes, you? Sometimes, if I'm like pulling, it's very excessive. We have a lot of it in our... What kind of plant scares you when you step on it? I bet nobody knows this. Java it's a, it's moss. a very strange trivia question. It's got to be Java moss. Val. Val scares you. Yes. Oh, because it wraps around your no, foot? No. Oh, my gosh. No. If, say, like if you're pulling some out or, or whatever and you happen to drop some, it's it's like it, it crunches. When you step on it, it crunches. I'm telling you. And it almost I, sounds I like you're you. breaking just... a piece of plastic or glass or something, and it's just Val. <laughs> Try it. Pull Try out a it. piece of Val, step on it with a flip-flop. You tell me. Not with a flip flop. You'd have to do it with your bare foot. No, Wouldn't I, that be dangerous? Could well, you get a jungle bell paper wear. cut? You could. Another I think I got a why. paper cut today from my fountain grass. I was moving my fountain grass. So is it technically a, a paper cut when it's no. caused by an aquatic plant? It's a plant cut. No, I think we a should still cut? call it a paper cut. Paper cut. It's a paper cut. It's a jungle bell paper cut. <laughs> so maybe yeah, leave your shoes on. So that was a big miss on our part, not having, not me not saying where it is, where, where are the shoes? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So oh, well. anyway, if you are somebody then, a lot of you, all right, so I'm curious, again, in the in the chat section, are you a, are you a snail person? Are you the type of person to say, yeah, me, I'm, I'm the snail person. I don't mind them. I just let them be because I got a lot of comments about that. And, and again, I feel you. I, I understand. I agree with you. That's why I make no effort to get rid of snails. And so I'll tell people how to get rid of them. And we can have fun with the little votes like, hey, which one would you want to be infested with? As if it's infestation is a, a bad thing. I mean, if you're infested with them, yeah, it's bad. But Yeah, it looks yucky. It, yeah, it might not look all that appealing. But I don't make any effort. Do you make an effort in any of the tanks that you... I have before, sure. You, what do you do? Yeah. Just, just pick Manual. them out? Manual. Although the, the one little trap that I got, it does work. Not it's, it's not too bad. So if you, like every day, you put it down there and you put little, you know, stuff in there... And, um, yeah, just kind of manually pick out some. But I will spend more time pulling out those little stupid trumpet snails. <laughs> well, good luck with that because the trumpet snails, the, the thing about the trumpet snails is they can literally survive anything. I know they can. You know, I've always yeah. said if a, you know, a, a big ball of light 
explodes somewhere on Earth, you're going to have cockroaches and trumpet snails. Yeah. That's what you're going to have left. I and they're agree. going to duke it out for world supremacy. And I, snails my, are going to win. They're going to win because they're going to burrow. Yeah. <laughs> and then six million years later, they're going to be like, what's up, man? What's up? I'm just here chilling. And by the way, there's a billion of us now under this substrate. Oh, my God. I've, I've left those things. And some of you have probably done the same. I've left Malaysian trumpet snails and buckets of gravel, put those buckets of gravel in the garage for months and months and months. And you think that the, the bucket is completely dried out. And so maybe you're going to reuse that substrate. And you dump it out. And there are Malaysian trumpet snails moving. There they are. What in the heck were they doing the last year? They just go into a state of, of semi-hibernation and just chill out because it's crazy. It's crazy. Damara says, I have tiny baby assassin snails. <laughs> yep. That assassin would be cute. Assassin snails are cool. Uh, that is, we have a few, a few tanks where we have assassin snails. And by the way, those two, a lot of people will be like, oh, I'm going to put assassin snails in my aquarium to get rid of whatever pest snail you have. So there's a couple things you have to consider. One, you usually need more assassin snails than what you're going to add to an aquarium, especially if you've got a lot of pond snails or ram's horn snails. People are like, oh, I've got like 5,000 of these snails in my aquarium. I'm going to dump one or two assassin snails in there and everything's going to be fine in a week. No, usually you're going to need a, you might need a half a dozen to a dozen in a 20 gallon if you've got a decent number of pest snails. And it's going to take them time, right? They're not just going to go in and be like, oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. They're not just like psycho things, like, you know, all around the tank. It will take them time to do their job. So, well, um, second floor aquatics. Hi. So. Shannon says that Ryan uh, sells, says snails are great. His loaches love them. I, yeah, I mean, it's a great source of food. Back when we had the, so when we had the yeah. tinfoil barbs and the ballast sharks and the silver dollars and the 150 along with some of the cichlids, when we had some of those tanks that had a bunch of snails, I would take out, it was especially the case in the Pleco tanks. At one point we had a bunch of ram's horn snails and I would, I could, just scoop out like a net full, like to the point where the net was kind of heavy, dump them in the 150, and within 10 minutes, they were all gone. They loved eating those. They were, they'd get so excited. Right? You could see the tinfoil barbs, the ballast sharks, the silver dollars, like, oh, oh, snails, this is great. Uh, they loved it. So you can definitely, there's definitely a lot of fish out there. Like I said, most African cichlids, uh, a lot of even the smaller South and Central American cichlids, a lot of your loaches. If you've ever got a problem with snails in a small tank, the dwarf chain loach, they, they're really small. They're very tiny. Be careful with them because they can be a little bit ornery. They can kind of chase other fish around. They don't always do well in a small tank with one another as much. But we brought them in a couple times. And I think that's why in the 10 gallons, we, we basically had no snails there because when I was quarantining them, I had like three tanks set aside and I would move them and they wiped out all the snails. But they're, they're very small. So very small fish. Like it would definitely be appropriate for a nano type a setup. They're too small to keep with larger fish. But very cool. Pipple Punk. Pipple Punk. Thank you so much for the super chat. I love watching the snails in my tank glide around. Uh, Roomba, Roomba-ing up detritus and algae. The ram's horn in my tank are gorgeous. Uh, Malaysian trumpet snails are also great for overturning the substrate and planted tanks. Absolutely, all of that is true. And it can be a lot of fun. And for those of you who have kept, especially if you're keeping snails on purpose, like the mystery snails and the nearite snails and ram's horn, just kind of watching them, the little mouth just going boop, 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 all across the glass. Yeah. They're always doing something, mm -hmm. right? And they can be a nice barometer for your tank in terms of water quality. So for if sure. you ever see all your snails right around the top of the tank, like right next to the water line, there could be something's up. Maybe they're having a hard time with oxygen concentration. There could be something be you know, a little off with your water parameters. So they can tell you a lot about what's going on in your aquarium. The one thing I really liked if you were trying to trap snails, remember that Sierra, yeah. S-E-R-A? Did you ever look to see if it's for sale again? You know, I didn't. And I will have to do that because I talked to them at the last Aquashella, which was a while ago now, mm -hmm. and I thought they said they were coming back out with like a new and improved version. And people thought I was like making that up or faking it when yeah. I did that Sierra snail trap video it because was crazy. you put the little piece of food in there and the snails would go in from both sides and they would get trapped in there. They go in, that but they don't come out. whole thing was packed full of snails and I just opened up, plopped them all right in the 150 and... 
The fish loved it. And it's it's something that you have to actually assemble, right? Bunch of yes, little, like, that pieces. was a that was definitely a pain. Mm-hmm. Right, that was a pain, and you because it had these little like pegs or something like these little short things, and I mean, if you turn it upside down, they'd all fall out. So it was a little bit finicky, but my gosh, did that thing work awesome? Sure did. Yeah, no doubt about it. It was pretty cool. So Jay says, my 20-gallon with gravel substrate, I have snails infesting it that have white conical snails. Uh, those are probably the Malaysian trumpet snails. I dropped two assassin snails in there. One is now over an inch. Wow. Yeah, the Malaysian trumpet snails, if you give them enough time, they can get pretty big. I mean, the other ones that look like that are the trapdoor snails, which, believe it or not, did you pull those out of that 20-gallon when you broke it down with your... I think so. Where did you put those? Please tell me you didn't put them in with the same tank with all the other fish that you you probably did, didn't you? I really wanted to breed those. I know I the have trap zero. The trapdoor snails, they're, they're, they get bigger. I have zero and we recollection got like four where I actually put them. them. And I chucked them in that tank and I never saw them again. And then you were pulling know. plants out and I saw them. I'm like, oh my gosh, I forgot we had those. And I was going to tell you specifically where to put those. Mm-hmm. But if they wound up in the 40 with all those other fish... There no. were geos in there that might have decided that, that would have been a good meal. I, see, I would have thought that the geos, I would have assumed that the geos would go after them. So I don't I don't think I put them in there, but I don't remember so where I put them. somewhere in our fish room we have Let's hope. the trap door snails, and I have no idea where they're at. So, <gasps> yeah, that'll be a video someday. Like, look what I found. <gasps> we found them. And it's funny, too. Does anybody have that? Do you have a situation in where you have enough aquariums where you've bought fish before, then kind of forget that you've bought them or that you have them. And six months later, you're looking in a tank and like, oh, I forgot I had those things. I mean, because I'll do that from time to time. Especially the uh, hiders. You know, well, the that's clown, what I'm saying. The, the clown um, plecos. The blue phantom plecos. I forget mm-hmm. that I have. In fact, the crazy thing is we've got three blue phantom plecos floating around the fish room. So, yeah, we have three of them. Really? I know I the one's in... always out. Isn't he? No, they're never out. Well, no, I, I, take that, I take that back. The one that was in the middle top 40 yeah. with the brevis, he would mm-hmm. come out sometimes. You'd see him every once in a while. Yeah. But there's one in the bottom left 40 where the volcano tetras are right now. Mm-hmm. There is another one. This is what I'm talking about. It's somewhere. I think it wound up on the on, on the side that we broke down. It was on I, the bottom 75, wasn't it? I also, no, that was the uh, Spots Provolone. That was oh, a okay. Snowball Pleco. He's in the okay. other 75. He's out all the time. But we have three Blue Phantom Plecos, and I saw one in the top 125 with the Vieja the other day. It was like right on the front of the glass. I'm like, what the heck is that? I think I told one of the boys, if you found any Plecos in a certain tank when we were breaking it down, chuck it in the top 125, it needs more Plecos. And that happened to be one of them. So I'm like, oh, my gosh, thank goodness the Vieja are so chilled out because if they weren't, that blue phantom pleco is not quite big enough to uh, – it's, it's just not full grown. So that could have been a disaster. I'm glad that's worked out so far. Mm. And just so you know, Oink Master is not feeling very well today. Oh. and still has a fever. So not a fever. Please get better soon. Yeah. Hmm? Chill out. Yeah, get take some care of blankies. yourself. Get, and yes. a fan because, I mean, you're going to go yep. back and forth between being really True. hot and really cold. True. So that that's definitely, yeah. Whoop says, hey, Jason, I know that true apple snails aren't legal to keep down south because they're so invasive. But can we keep them up here in the, in the noise? In the noise. In Illinois. the noise. Oh, in the noise. In the Illinois. I don't, I mean, I've always, I, I know, know that. I don't know. Apple snails and mystery snails are not the same thing, right? No. Apple snails are the bigger. They're bigger. And I have no idea. I haven't. I don't think we've had them. If, if, I'm, if I'm right, and again, I'm not a snail expert, but I thought the apple snails and mystery snails were, were different. Tim, thank you so much for gifting five Primetime Aquatics memberships. That's pretty stinking awesome. Thank you for doing that. Now, because of that, we've got Michael and Emma and Strawberry and Julie and Beta Aquatics, and Scuba Steve. Scuba Steve, what's up? <laughs> Glad you're here. Uh, are now wow. new prime timers. Thank you very much for doing that. That's awesome. Appreciate it. That's so fun. Very cool. Very nice. All right, let me see here. Well, now we can start. Well, you know what? Well, you know what we should probably do? Hmm. Uh, because at some point, you're going to have to 
go and do your your thing. Yeah, I'm like so 10 minutes. I know. Dang so it. I think we'll do the we'll do the we'll do giveaway. the giveaway a little bit sooner than we normally do. And again, it's, okay. it's not this time. It's not super huge, but it's fun. Uh, and it is. We got the brand new issue of Amazonas Magazine. This is the latest and greatest. This just came out. We just got a couple of them in the mail. This is our copy. Your copy will be wrapped. Don't you worry. It's not the used Amazonas. Uh, but this is brand new. And for those of you who've been watching the channel for a while, you know that we are partnered with Amazonas Magazine because they are the greatest publisher of all time of any genre, in my humble opinion. Fantastic illustrations. Fantastic writing. It's going to make you feel smarter. <laughs> and it's still accessible. Uh, this particular issue is on the... Uh, the Amatalania cichlids, a lot of cool stuff. They also talk about some rare new tetras and some tiny, I don't think you've seen this yet, but tiny, tiny, tiny miniature fish. Oh. Yes, that's right. So that's Yee. what's in this episode of Amazonas episode issue. You issue. know what I mean. And by the way, if you are interested in Amazonas, I do have a link down in the description below. Uh, there's a little bit, again, we're a partner with them. So prime time community you get a little bit of a benefit from that, if you will. So check it out if you're interested. So what we're going to do, this one's going to be a little different. Okay, we're not doing the number thing today. Uh, what we're going to be doing, and by the way, in order to get said magazine, you have to live in the 48 continental United States because that's where we can ship to. So that's kind of the story. Now, again, we're not doing the numbers. And by the way, you're going to want to be on live, what is it, all messages, not top chat. Because that will show you the actual order, or at least I think it does. It's the one that's going to give us the closest order. And so today. And you have to be in all messages. Too. I literally just said that. All messages. I want to make sure again. All messages. This is what I deal with every day. I, I say, say something. Too. Oh, really? You want to start with that? No. No. No, no. you don't. She, I'm not the only one that has to deal I with it. I literally have to repeat. Like, and I just literally. do it. Literally. Literally. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So here we go. What you have to do. This is, I, I, this is going to be a little stressful, mm -hmm. and a lot of you won't know this, and it's okay, but I just wanted to change it up just for this, this time. The Pop first quiz. person who can tell me what the fish was that was featured in Monday. Mondays? No. Crap. Hold on. Not go. Yesterday's. Sorry. Yesterday's short. What was yesterday's short? What was the fish that I featured yesterday? Yesterday being Tuesday. Boom, oh, done. Wow. That was quick. Wow. <laughs> Holy cow. I love it, man. There's like a billion people who like Look knew it. It's that. already over. Here I thought nobody would get it. Good I job, you guys. Man, oh man. Wow. That's crazy. So that was a really quick competition. It was the fastest one ever. And yep. so after I hit the go button and finally did the thing, uh, Michelle, Michelle Prang, you were the first one that said Volcano Tetra. And that is actually true. That was the one that was featured yesterday. It was in the tank with the Congo Tetras and all that stuff. So you are going to get the Amazonas Magazine. So uh, you're local. So that means you can either send us the email at primetimegiveaway at yahoo.com or... We can arrange a meetup, and I can just give you said magazine. And or then you are you going to be at the GCCA? Or if you're going to be at one of the swaps, we can give it to you there, too. You just need to let us Take know what pick. is your preference. Preference one, we mail it. Preference two, and we if don't. we mail it, primetime giveaway at yahoo.com. We meet somewhere, and I will hand this to you myself. Or oh, she'll be at GCCA. Boom. We'll boom. bring it. All right. Awesome. So... Oh, Thanks for playing, everybody. Yay. And don't worry. Next time we're gonna we'll switch it up a little bit and we'll do something different. So yeah, that's short yesterday. I don't think a lot of people have seen those those before. And yeah, they're crazy cool. They're awesome. I I brought them in at one point. These volcano tetras. They're and they're bitterlings. So on our list, what they show is volcano tetra, and then it says bitterling next to it. So there's. I guess it's technically a, a volcano barb, if you will. And some people pointed that out on the short, but I was just going by what the common name is. But at some point, I have to do a species profile because the deal is these are really rare fish, and you don't see them around very often. I remember seeing them on a list, like, I got to have them. And they were really expensive to bring in, and they were even more expensive when 
Uh, we sold them at the swaps, but they sold out almost instantly because they are absolutely insane looking fish. So if you want to know what they look like, just go back to our channel, check out that little short. I know some of you don't like the shorts. In fact, I know probably a lot of you watching the live stream now are like, shorts, I just like the long form. Totally understand that. But if you want to see what they look like, check it out. Yesterday's short was those volcano tetra slash barbs slash the bitterlings. So pretty awesome, pretty awesome fish. So uh, Chris says, can Joanna recommend a safe tall plant for rainbows? They're eating all my temple plants down to twigs. Huh. I'm, so rainbows, generally speaking, um, have left pretty yeah. much most of our, or all of our, oh, uh, is that true? We don't know. Who's eating, who was eating it, uh, the bell? You know, that's a good question. So now I'm kind of rethinking that statement a little bit. Yeah, I never well, pictured right, them well, as Well, let's, let's put eaters. it this way. We have rainbows in a 75, heavily planted. They mm -hmm. have absolutely left Crips and Anubius, the Anubius and the Java, uh, Java fern alone. Mm -hmm. We've had Val in there for a very long time. It used to be extremely long, but as I've added more rainbows, I, I wonder if they were... Could they have been munching on it? They might have been. Maybe a little bit because it, a little snack here I, and there. I remember saying to you just a couple of weeks ago, like, yeah. oh, you know, that stuff really hasn't grown as much. And now that I think about it, maybe it was when I put in more rainbows, but I also didn't see them as being a crazy plant eating fish either because you usually see them in planted tanks. So Jungle Val, I think just because it's going to outgrow any problems that you're probably going to have would be my, I know you were supposed to answer that. Do you confirm, do you want to confirm or deny my suggestion? No, I second it. She seconds it. So mm -hmm. I would go with the Val. James, thank you so much for the super chat. Update, had to get a 210 for frontosis. <laughs> oh. I love that. I had to get a 210 oh, wow. for the frontosis. I just had to, I <laughs> didn't have a choice. I had to do it. I agree with you. Uh, all that would fit. Um, they love it. New Simulus are breeding, very nice. Found three fry. Uh, brine shrimp, live baby brine. Okay, I'm assuming that's what that is. Yes, uh, absolutely it is. But the actual question, do you know a shop worth a stop around Gatlinburg, Tennessee? That's a great question. In fact, if someone does know a shop, first of all, I don't. I've only been there once, but we're gonna be passing through there again on the way to Aquashella. So if somebody has Gatlinburg slash Knoxville, mm -hmm. Like, is that true? Yeah, that's that's yeah. about where we would want it. Like, the, I'm sure there's got to be something in the Knoxville area. So if, you, if anybody's familiar with that area, like Gatlinburg, Knoxville area, if there's a cool pet store down that way, would love to know that. And so would James, because uh, we're going to be heading down that way. And apparently you are too. And we want to know. So that would be awesome. It was on. Thank you so much for the super chat. Hey, guys, Joanna, that's you. I really loved your video on pet smart plants. You didn't mention anything about plant quarantine. Is that mm -hmm. something that you would do with pet smart plants, Anubias and swords? Well, uh, I think a number of people do quarantine their plants. I don't. I've never had an issue. Um, yeah. So I think it's especially unnecessary with the pet smart plants, at least the ones that we buy because they come prepackaged mm -hmm. and the likelihood that there's going to be any parasite attached to them uh, is pretty low and, and even snails because again they're they're in those packages for a pretty long time. Most likely there's not going to be stuff on there. I don't recall ever bringing like snails or something into the fish room because of those plants. There's been a lot of other times when we've brought stuff in that you, I think it's much more likely when you buy plants from a local fish store where it's just kind of in, in those tank. big tanks. Might, yeah. There might be some snails in there. Not that that's a bad thing. Again, I don't really care. Uh, there's lots of advantages to buying plants from your local fish store. Sometimes they're cheaper. Sometimes they're bigger. They have a much greater selection. So those are all good things. But those ones that come prepackaged from like PetSmart, we, I don't think we've ever had an issue with bringing stuff into our fish tanks from it. Emily says, Aquarium Knoxville is a great fish store, definitely in my top three that I visited. Aquarium Knoxville. So that's what it's called, huh? That's the name of the store. That's kind of cool. Uh, William says, list. hit up Daytona Aquarium while you're in Florida. Awesome fish store and cichlid breeders. Right? Write this, put this on your list, please. What do you think We're, I'm doing here with this pen? I don't know what you're doing. Okay. Man, nobody knows um, what you're doing. Aquarium, so, Aquarium Knoxville. Aquarium Knoxville and then 
Daytona Aquarium. That's obviously in Daytona. Oh, thank so you. Any other suggestions? Would love to hear from people who are from around that area. If there's cool places to see, that'd be awesome. Do you know what time it is? For another giveaway? No, it's time for you to leave us alone so I can talk in <laughs> front of your back. <laughs> yeah. In secret you, on the live stream. That's right, in sure. secret, because I know I've got a bunch of people sure. here who are not going to share those secrets, and that's all that matters to me. Okay. Because uh, our child is going to be wondering, did you know last week he texted me wondering where I was, and then I got the text after you guys got home. So that's oh, the really? type of father, that's... apparently, that I am. Wow. And then I was like, well, yeah, I was you're trying, here. I'm, I was trying to find him, actually. Oh, and yeah, I was... you got to go to the other side of the building. So. I know. I found that out. Yeah, that's good. We had to find that out the hard way, too, after we walked all around the parking lot looking for stuff. Okay. Uh, so everybody say goodbye to Say goodbye to Juice Box. Over here. So, buy a Juice Box. Literally do it. Literally Anyone? Wave. Anyone? We buy the juice box. It's another random. It's a movie. Random quote. movie. This one might be hard for you. I don't. I don't know anybody yeah. who would know it. Oh, bye, Lynn. Right. Bye, everybody. Come on, bye, y'all. Okay. You're, you're ruining my whole vibe. I'm gonna. I don't think anybody over. knows it. I don't think anybody knows the. No. We buy the juice box. Do it. Take a lap. Tuck in your shirt. <laughs> Hold on. Now I gotta move. Pardon me. Ugh. This is the awkward part where I try to center myself. Oh my gosh. There we go. Uh, oh. Bouncing on the table. Let's get all this set. Oh, that's so weird. No, no, I'm off. Am I off center? Yeah. This is so weird. Why am I? Wait, I, no, I want to go this way. Sorry. I'm all messed up. So anyway, the movie quote was from Kicking and Screaming, if you didn't know that. Watched that movie like 6,000 times with our kids back when they were small. Well, Punk, thank you so much for the super chat. If you want 0% chance of snails, plant with tissue cultures. Uh, but I adore snails, so I don't mind hitchhikers. Yeah, I don't either, but you're absolutely right. And I was going to mention that, and then I realized that Joanna had to leave, and I forgot to. But absolutely, tissue culture plants are a definite way you can go to avoid all the things that may be bad. But I, again, I don't worry about it. So just to fully complete that thought... We don't quarantine plants. I haven't had an issue yet. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I just don't bother. Then he says, I have a five-year-old, 125, with one ballast shark, one angel, one common pleco, and five silver dollars. Can I add more fish? If so, suggestions may be also a centerpiece. That's what I was thinking too. Love the channel. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, it's 125. It's a nice size, nice size tank. Uh, the, so your angel in some ways is kind of like a centerpiece fish. The the one that comes to mind is obviously one of my favorite, not obviously, but it is one of my favorite fish, and that is some type of geophagus. Uh, they, they tend not to be, they're cichlid, but they tend not to be over aggressive, probably fit in well with the fish that you have. You know, the angel fish, obviously, that's the main thing where if there's going to be any aggression issues, it probably be between the angel fish that's been established there for a while and some other centerpiece type of cichlid, which really with a tank that size, you're looking at cichlids as your centerpiece fish. But the geophagus are absolutely phenomenal. You can go larger geophagus, so uh, geophagus altifrons. You got your whole Cernomensis group, which is your altifrons, your megasema, uh, the what's, uh, wine milleri. They're, they all look very similar. Those are really, really pretty fish. You have to have a little bit of patience in terms of watching them grow up and finally develop those those fin trailers and everything. But when you have patience, you will be rewarded. They're a great fish. And you could do more than one in a 125. I mean, maybe what you do is you buy a half a dozen that are just a couple inches. Now, keep them. Don't, you're going to get a little bit of sticker shock if you buy these from the pet store because they can usually be even at a couple inches, 25, 30 bucks a piece. Buy four to six and just be prepared maybe later on if they're starting to quarrel a little bit. Sometimes they're fine. Sometimes they they might fight a little bit. And if that happens, just remove a couple, sell them off. They're going to be worth a ton of money as they get older. Uh, it's one of those fish where that's not a fish. If it doesn't work, you just take it back to the pet store and hope that they'll give you a you know, small credit. Those are fish that when they are five, six, seven inches and showing amazing color, they go for a lot of money because it takes a while for them to grow up and look absolutely stunning. So that's that's kind of how I would roll with it. Chris says, why don't feeder guppies or ghost shrimp introduce illness into an aquarium? No quarantine? Oh, they absolutely do. They absolutely do. And I think they do more than people realize. I don't do feeder fish. 
And that's one of the reasons why. I mean, one reason why is I just don't like to see fish eating other fish. It's not my thing. Uh, for some people, there's just no way around that because they have larger fish and that's primarily their diet. But if I did have a situation where I was feeding feeder guppies and stuff like that, I wouldn't. I don't worry as much about the ghost shrimp if they're only in a tank, isolated with other ghost shrimp. I wouldn't worry as much. But the feeder guppies and feeder goldfish especially, I mean, if you think about the genetics of those fish just from the start, they're a disaster because they're being bred to get large enough to feed to other fish. And so genetics are completely out the window at that point. I mean, have you, has anybody actually ever looked closely at a feeder goldfish tank? I mean, I don't know if PetSmart and Petco are still doing that. I haven't been to one in so long and looked at their fish, but actually looked at those fish and seen how many sunken bellies and bent spines and bulging eyes and crooked fins and just crooked bodies. And they're barely even surviving and they're packed in this aquarium, just absolutely packed together and so if there is a disease it can spread really easily i just if i can avoid it i'm not taking that chance uh, it's better what a lot of people will do is if you have fish like we had chuck and chuck was a chaka chaka cat loved that fish kevin's got him now but that fish only ate live fish luke brought it home one time and i'm like he didn't do his research and i'm like dude now we gotta feed this thing live fish well guess what the live fish that we fed it came from other aquariums in our fish room where we were just breeding them and we could just put them right in. They weren't coming from a pet store. So just keep that in mind. Barbara, thank you very much for the super chat. I just purchased a 20 gallon round, ooh, 20 gallon round aquarium. That's kind of cool. Uh, what fish would you recommend to complement tank and fish? You know what I, you know what would be, so it's a round aquarium, like a cylinder. One of the coolest things I'd ever seen uh, when it comes to round aquariums is the Aquashella. It, it must have been Aquashella Dallas. It was, I think it was the first Dallas Aquashella back in 20, it must have been 2019. Aquarium Gallery has, I think it's, or Fish Gallery, Fish sorry, Fish Gallery has a big cylindrical tank that they bring in and they will stock it different every year. And the, the first year that they came, they stocked it full of either neon tetras or cardinals. I don't remember which. And there were some rams in there as well. And these tetras just swam so peacefully and so elegantly and gracefully as a big giant group in a circle all weekend long. And they weren't stressed out or anything. That was just what they were doing. They were schooling. And I know a lot of people don't like the circular tanks for a couple reasons. One, Sometimes it will distort a little bit the way the fish look. Uh, two, they worry about if the fish are getting a distorted view of the world around them. But a cylindrical tank does things for fish, especially schooling fish that you cannot find or see in a square or rectangular aquarium that has 90 degree angles. So with your 20 gallon, it would be cool to have that same sort of feel. Obviously the group isn't going to be as large, but you could certainly do some type of a small tetra. So some of your neon types, if you wanted to stay smaller and get an even larger group, I'm thinking things like your chili rasbora, your dwarf rasboras, uh, something that's going to, uh, the uh, rummy nose rasbora, these fish that like to kind of stay together. The brilliant green rasbora would be cool because they naturally like to school together, although they get somewhat large. And you keep a group of maybe a dozen or so and just watch them do this all the time. And they're just going to be like, ah, this is great. We're going somewhere. We're constantly swimming. And this is fun for us. So that's what I would do. Buck, thank you very much for the super chat. Love your channel and the information you provide. I am curious. I have a hard time feeding my Cordoras and Loach with three goldfish I have. Uh, a feeding cage. Okay, yeah, I mean, goldfish are crazy. They're little pigs. It just happens. They love to just chomp, chomp, chomp. They eat pretty fast. And I could totally see that because right now we've got a weird mix of fish in one of our 75s because, like I said, we broke down a bunch of tanks. And right now we've got goldfish mixed in with other types of fish. And it's working fine. It's not a permanent solution. But they do. They're like, man, you put that food on, pop, pop, out. They're just eating. The nice thing is you can set up two different feeding levels with those fish. So you've got your quarries and your loaches, which are primarily taking food from the bottom of the tank and your goldfish, which just don't care. If you can do some type of a flake food, be a little bit careful because I know some people worry about goldfish if they're gulping air. Sometimes they might get a little bit of bloat. I haven't had, ever had that happen, like never. And I've had goldfish since that was the first fish I ever got when I was six years old. 
and I've had goldfish a lot of times. I've never, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I just, I've never had the problem where, oh, they gulped air and now they're all, I don't know, swollen or something like that or bloated. But if you have some food that will float at the top, at the same time you have sinking pellets, the goldfish to kind of avoid the feeding frenzy at the bottom sometimes will go with the maybe like the really slow, small sinking pellets or some flake food. And then you're dropping in maybe like algae wafers. Uh, I just did the video today on the kelp wafer. I love that. I love those things. A lot of people think the kelp wafers are just for algae eating fish like your plecos and stuff but in that video i showed the cardinal touchers were feeding on those the quarry cats we were talking at the swap last week because there are people i bring north fin foods to the swaps and i sell the kelp wafers and what they quarry cats will do is they do this little quarry cat spinning tornado motion where they're just going around and they're eating these things and so that would be something where depending on the size of your goldfish your goldfish are a little bit smaller and they can't consume that big kelp wafer the other bottom feeders like your loaches and your quarry cats might be able to do that. And then the goldfish will hopefully eat the flakes and stuff from up above. So that's something I would try. Uh, definitely. And the other thing too is as fish settle in, you may start to notice your quarry cats and certainly your loaches become a little bit more aggressive around feeding time because being a little bit hungry will bring out a, a lot more activity in fish when they're starting to be outcompeted for food. I don't necessarily depend on that, so I'd rather go with the multi-layer feeding. However, you'll you'll start to see, I mean, that, that for some of you who've kept quarry cats or loaches or even plecos, you'll start to see them come out and be a little bit more protective of the space where they think the food is going to be when they know, hey, you know, these other fish are trying to eat and I'm getting hungry. So that's how I would do it. But uh, Aquatics, thanks for being here. What's the minimum size for a pair of checkerboard cichlids to be happy, healthy, or do they need bigger groups? No, I a, a pair is fine. So uh, they're not super aggressive. I've had them in tanks as small as a 10 gallon. Uh, I don't know if long term that's the greatest. Uh, a 20 gallon would certainly be acceptable, but I remember when I was I brought in some, they were pretty small. I I don't remember where I got them. I don't remember if I got them from a wholesaler, if I brought them in on a list or if I got them from a meeting. I, I might have gotten them from a, I think I got them from a green water like party where they do the points auctions. But anyway, I had a big group of like 10 of them in a 10 gallon growing up. They were really small, really small. But they stayed in there for a while. They had basically left each other alone. And then I eventually split the group up, split it up into like the 50 gallon low boy and one of the 75s. And I think we still have a couple left floating around the fish room somewhere. But a 20, a 20 gallon is perfectly fine for a pair. They don't get very big. And if you've ever seen a checkerboard cichlid before for other people, they are absolutely awesome. So if you look up checkerboard cichlid, they stay small, crazy amount of color, not very aggressive, certainly can go in a, in a, in a mostly community tank with like quarry cats and, and tetras and some of the medium-sized reservoirs. That would not be a problem. Freshwater fish and foliage, thank you so much for the super chat. Hey, PTA, Primetime Aquatics. Can I pre-purchase female bristlenose plecos? Can't do the larger face flanges, haha. <laughs> do they sell any rock work at the swap? So, a couple things. The plecos that we sell on the website are too small to really figure out they're male or female. They're only gonna be a couple inches. That's why they're only like three bucks. So they're, they're pretty small. Um, if you buy a few, chances are good. You're gonna wind up with hopefully at least one female. And then if you're like, oh, this one's starting to grow those bristles, then just get rid of it, sell it off, bring it back to me, uh, sell, trade it into a pet store for some fish food. You know, three bucks is, is not that much. You grow it up for a little while after usually about three inches or so, they start forming the bristles, you can get rid of it. Um, but so I, I can't guarantee whether you get males or females. Uh, as far as rocks go, absolutely. There will be people there selling. Well, I shouldn't say absolutely. The GCCA, most likely, there will be at least one or two tables there selling some rocks. It's typically going to be like Dragonstone and the Seiryu Stone. I'm trying to get the Seiryu Stone back in because I used, we used to sell that all the time. And then uh, all of our sources, it was really, really tough to get in uh, the Seiryu Stone for a while. And now it's starting to come back. So I won't have it this time, but hopefully the next time, maybe. But there should be people there at the GCCA selling, selling rocks. Cameron says, what are your thoughts on the zebra pleco? I'm wanting to breed some for profit. Well, you can if you can breed them, you will definitely make a profit. Those are, 
still, uh, even right now, some, a decently expensive Pleco. Uh, you got to obviously have a little bit of experience. I don't have any experience breeding any types of Plecos other than, let's see, what's bred for me? Uh, all, all the different varieties of bristle nose. I don't remember, did I get the clown plecos? I thought I saw clown pleco babies at one point, but I haven't bred any of these other ones. And so I'm not a super great expert in terms of like water parameters, how close do you have to get them to the, the natural, you know, does that, do you have to go softer water with a lower pH to get them to breed? I don't know that. But if you can get them to breed, you will absolutely make money because they still go for quite a bit. Vinny, thank you so much for becoming a prime time partner, prime timer. Appreciate it. Let's see here. I am scrolling. Crystal says, what can I put in my 10 gallon tank to eat hair algae off my crypts? Well, it depends on what fish you have in the 10 gallon. A mono shrimp will absolutely devour green hair algae. I remember I brought some mono shrimp in. This was maybe a year ago. I brought a lot of it in, a lot of them in, a couple hundred. And I split them up into a couple 10 gallon tanks. And in those 10 gallon tanks, I had Java moss that was absolutely covered with green hair algae to the point where I was like, I was just getting ready to throw it all away. And I basically broke up half of that Java moss green hair algae into those two tanks and let, now that was an extreme example, right? You're not going to have that many amount of shrimp, but again, I was holding them for a short period of time. And within a week, it was all gone. And I was starting to pull green hair algae from other tanks, and just chucking it in there so they could eat it. And they were just, they were taking care of business, man. So definitely a mono shrimp with the green hair algae. Every once in a while, you might see some guppies kind of snack on it. It's not a guarantee. So that would be my, my number one go-to with the green hair algae. The other one is the Florida flagfish, but I wouldn't... Could you put them in a 10-gallon? Yes. If there's other fish in there, it might not be the best idea because they can be a little bit aggressive, but they will absolutely eat green hair algae as well. And definitely not with shrimp. Like I would not put Florida flagfish in with any invertebrate. I don't trust them. Laura says, thanks for the info on the checkerboards. I was hoping to maybe just get a pair for breeding. You could do a you could do a breeding pair in a 10. If that's all that's going in there and you just want to breed them in a 10 gallon, you could do it. A lot of, a lot of people in our clubs do that. Not a big deal. Put some plants in there, put a cave in there, and you'd be good to go. Grow and clip. Bonsai, what's going on? Bristle nose, plecos, albino. Mine bred like crazy. I have about 100 in my 55 gallon. Oh, you know what? That's the thing, too. When they breed... I, same thing happened to me in our bot when we had the bottom 55 set up at one point before the geophagus were in there i don't remember what fish were in there but i had put in like three or four bristle nose just because i did well it turned out and i had a cave I had, actually i didn't have a cave in there i had rock work and they decided to breed in there and all of a sudden i had like 40 in that 55 gallon that was not supposed to be a bristle nose breeding tank and as fun as it is to see those little babies, you start looking at it. You're like, okay, this is a heavily planted tank. There's a ton of stuff in here. I'm never going to get these things out of here. And 40 or 50 bristle nose or 30 or 40 bristle nose in a 55 gallon, it can be done and people do it all the time. But when it's not supposed to be the main fish in that tank and you're not set up for breeding, they can make one heck of a mess because now you're trying to feed these things and trying to catch them out. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that can be a real adventure. Lear says, how do you clean a tank with a bunch of plants in it? Do you do gravel, uh, gravel vac? So with the plants, let's take these tanks, right? Tons of plants. They're not very big, but I mean, we've had planted tanks that were just as planted as these, only larger. There's a couple things that I consider. When, so for first of all, with gravel vacuuming, if you've actually got gravel, yeah, I will gravel vac around where I think the roots are not currently growing. So if I've got a lot of rooted plants like crypts and things like that, I will kind of, by the way, crypt roots can spread pretty far. They can cover the entire bottom of a tank. But I will do some gravel vacuuming because I don't want a ton of detritus building up in there. Uh, if there's any algae on the front pane of the glass, I will usually try to remove that as well. Uh, water changes depends on the tank. I mean, larger tanks that are more heavily stocked might be getting a 20, 25, 30% water change. I'm using my nitrate concentrations to make that determination. 
Uh, for us, we don't use any liquid or, or liquid fertilizers or root tabs once the tanks are established. We haven't found the need with the easier plants that we keep. We just haven't found the need. So like these tanks here, for the most part, they don't, nothing. I do nothing. You know, if there's a little, this tank right here tends to get a little bit more algae in the front glass. This tank was supposed to be a nice looking tank for the back of the live stream. Clearly it is not that anymore because what wound up happening is we put some Florida lease killifish in there and now they're breeding like crazy and they're using this nasty mess of subwasser tank covered in algae to basically all the little babies are just like pow, pow, pow and they're picking off of that and they're eating the microfauna off that subwasser tank mess. And so I don't want to touch it because I'm. it's now become a Florida lease killifish breeding tank. So... But for the most part, these tanks don't get water changes. We, we, I'll just keep topping them off, and I do. I check water parameters, and everything is fine. The fish are fine. The nitrate concentrations stay low because there's basically very few fish in there relative to the amount of plants. But if the nitrate concentrations started creeping up 25, 30 parts per million on a regular basis, I would water change that so it's down around 10 or 15 and let it climb a little bit, not to go over 20. So that's what I do. Jesse says, what do you think about frogs? coming for you jesse they're coming for you all the frogs are coming for you i like frogs i so i'm going to assume that we're talking about maybe the the african dwarf frog i've had them in the fish room before they can be a little bit tricky if you're trying to keep them with fish just because fish eat a lot faster than the, than the dwarf frogs do so you have to be mindful of that it can still work uh, usually targeted feeding <laughs> sorry uh, targeted feeding is probably the best way to go with small pellets if they're if they will take pellets. Sometimes they don't at first. With our dwarf frogs, we had to feed them some bloodworms, but it was we almost had to take the forceps and put it right in their face, and then they would definitely eat it. But you know, we had at one point in a 29 gallon, we had like three or four of them. We had some guppies in the tank. It was when this we had a 29 gallon in the boys' room when they were real small, and that became a little bit problematic. We put those dwarf frogs down in the fish room later on with some slower eating fish that worked fine larger frogs i i don't keep larger frogs like some people will sell tadpoles and stuff as a kid we had i had tons and tons of frogs all over the place in the garage i had them in the, my parents let me keep a big giant tank of frogs just like regular frogs in the house here's a story so i don't know how old i am at the time i'm maybe 10 years old and I caught all these frogs at the creek. I bring them home. I put them in I, what probably was like a 55-gallon tank. And as kids, you just do what you think makes sense to a 10-year-old kid. So I put some rocks in there. I don't know why, but me and my friends, we thought it was a good idea whenever we had frogs. We'd take this really long grass, and we kind of put it on top of the rocks. Well, that was a dumb idea because... Well, it looked fine at first. Of course, the grass starts to die and it starts to rot and it starts to foul up the water. And so now my mom's like, hey, you got to get in there and clean this tank. So I take the lid off the aquarium and I'm just kind of getting the grass. I'm throwing it out, you know, out in the garbage and stuff. Well, I didn't put the lid back on the aquarium. I come back. And my mom's like, the frogs are everywhere. And I had like 10 frogs in that tank. And so now I'm trying to catch all these frogs that are hopping all around the house. I caught eight of them. I have no idea to this day where the other two went. Never found them. Don't know where they went. But yeah, had lots of frogs when we were kids. But the dwarf frogs are pretty cool. Like them. Vinny, thank you so much for the super chat. Thanks for the help. How do you feel about a Vieja as a centerpiece? Absolutely. Absolutely love the Vieja. And a 125, that would work well. Uh, if you've seen any of our... Uh, what did I do? What did I do? Did I do a short on the Vieja... Or did I show it off on Sunday's video? When I, I think maybe I showed it off. I don't remember if I showed it off on Sunday's video. I think I did. Uh, we've got a group of 10 Viejas and Spilum in our 125. Love that fish. The only thing I will say, at least for us, is ours tend to be pretty shy. Like still to this day, when I walk in the room, they're kind of like, oh, you know, should we come out? And then as I feed them, they're getting a little bit better. But we, I've had those fish since they were like an inch and they're still a little bit shy, but insanely awesome color. I also have the Vieja Argentia, also known as the Mascoheros Argentia. That is a stunning, stunning, stunning fish. Uh, get a little bit larger, a little bit more aggressive. That one I would only keep as a single in that aquarium, but it's a, it's a silver fish that is very pearly. Uh, that is the one, you, if you want to see what they look like when I did the, the video of the Keystone Clash, 
when I went over all the different fish in the bowl show, that to me, that fish, that vieja, absolutely should have won best in show. It was magnificent fish. So those are just two. There's other. You know, the black belts are, are really awesome too. But sure, you could definitely do that. Thoughts on an indoor pond used as a sump system for multiple aquariums. Indoor pond. So if it's an indoor pond and you're going to use it as a sump system for multiple aquariums, uh, if that's the case, then it's probably not a sump system anymore unless you're, well, let me rephrase, unless it's just going to be growing plants and stuff. You're not going to put any livestock in there because the purpose of a sump obviously is for filtration. And then that's a great idea. So if you can run it, and a lot of people will do that. They'll actually have not necessarily an indoor pond, but the sump systems they have in their aquarium underneath might be a 55 gallon tank or a 75 gallon. And they're, of course, they've got their filter sock and they're running it. And you've got your filter floss and they're running through all their biomedia. And then there's a big section of that aquarium where they have a light and they're growing fast growing plants that are pulling out the nitrates. And so if you're thinking about doing the pond, as more or less a thing that's going to grow a bunch of plants to pull nitrates out, definitely like a hydroponics sort of system. That could be cool. Very cool. David says, it's a fun weekend with when Aquashella and the NRBC are same weekend in Chicago. Speaking of frogs, so is that is that the case next year in, I guess it, I'm not as familiar with the NARBC. Is that the reptile thing? Can you help me out with that? I think it is, right? Uh, is that the one in Tinley Park? So if that's the same weekend, that is cool. You can see both. Makes an even better reason to go. Okay, let me see here. I saw a question I wanted to answer. And by the way, just a reminder, if you've got questions, put at Primetime Aquatics in your question. That highlights it for me, and it makes it easier for me to know there's a question there. What's up, Zen Ginger? Glad you're here. My pink flamingo sent its roots across the floor of my 20 long in less than a month. They're crazy fast. That's cool. It's really interesting. I don't know. For those of you who keep planted tanks, especially if you're newer to planted tanks, if you ever look under the aquarium, if you have the ability to do that and watch the root systems grow, especially like things like crypts and sword plants, they get a very extensive root system. It's, it's kind of fun to see. Grow and clip says my 10 gallon, my male and female bread, and now I have 40 babies in it also. I know, oh man, I know how it is with those bristle nose. And I told this story a week or two ago. I I, I almost always want to tank in the fish room where I'm breeding bristle nose. I have a bristle nose fear, a phobia that someday I'm gonna not have them breeding and I'm gonna need them and I won't have them available. I am so used to over the years. If I need bristlenose in an aquarium, I'm like, I'll just go to the bristlenose tank, grab a couple, and chuck them in there. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll put the bristlenose in a quarantine tank just to keep it cycled because they do like to eat and everything. Uh, just to keep, you know, the smaller bristlenose, keep a couple in a 10-gallon. I'll put a couple in a 20-gallon when there's no fish in there just to kind of keep it going, keep the beneficial bacteria, give them something to do. Karen says, I have an Aquion 10 on my 20-gallon but the flow is a little too much. Do you have a suggestion for another self-priming filter that I can adjust the flow? Also need for my 10 and seven and a half. For the seven and a half, there is the, it's called Aquatop. I did a video on it. If you want to check it out, just type in uh, Aquatop. It's called the Forza, F-O-R-Z-A, Forza 5 to 15. It's a pretty small hang on back filter. So I'm thinking more that for the seven. It works on a 10. I've used them for 10s, but the seven and a half gallon especially. It's not self-priming though. So that will be an issue, but it is adjustable. So you can adjust the flow if you're looking for something where you can adjust the flow. Uh, the, the smallest filters that are self-priming are going to be the Seachem Title 35, that's still a pretty big filter, but for a 30, for a 10 gallon, I mean, you can really turn down that flow and it would work just fine. Uh, usually the problem with the Seachem Title 35 is the fact that it doesn't have an intake tube. It's got kind of like this box, but for a 10 gallon, that would work perfectly fine. You could turn the flow down on that one, self-priming. I think the Marineland Pro, the smallest it will go is a Marineland Pro 125, self-priming and very good adjustable flow there as well. But again, it's a it's kind of a big filter for a 10 gallon. Certainly it would look silly on a seven and a half just because it's a it's pretty large. For the seven and a half, I might go with the Forza uh, just because it's a smaller.
but it's not it's not a self priming the forza Perry says hope you are well I am thank you can you please let me know what I can use for algae eater with tiger barbs thank you for your time uh, tiger barbs it depends on the size of the aquarium I let's assume that you've got at least a 20 gallon for your tiger barbs the bristlenose pleco is definitely the way I would go because uh, tiger in if you can find bristlenose plecos that are I like to say they're past that that point where they can be a little bit finicky when you buy them from a pet store you get the one or two inch bristle nose and sometimes you bring it home it's like oh that didn't last very long but if you can find the two to three inch bristle nose they tend to just be a little bit more hardy yep oh my gosh everything just skipped around 904 says are chili red spores good tank mates with congo tetras starting my first my first tank and think they would look really stunning together they would i probably wouldn't put them together and the only reason for that is the Congo Tetra is full grown. They're, they're a big fish. They're a big Tetra and the Chili Rasboras stay tiny. I have no doubt that by the time the Congo Tetras reach a couple of inches, you, you will not have any more Chili Rasboras left. So if you have your heart set on the Chili Rasboras, you really have to stay really small fish because they are some of the smaller fish that you will buy. Uh, so with the chilies you're looking at, you know, if with tetras, nothing larger than mostly a neon size. So you're, there's all different types of varieties of neons and cardinal tetras and stuff. If you really want the Congos and you want something with a lot of red, cherry barbs, the males get a really super crazy red. That would be awesome. And the females still have a nice red color as well. So we did a species profile on cherry barb. Check it out. That's a really nice, pretty red fish. Ember tetras are more orange than red, but they would get large enough when full grown where I think the Congos would mostly leave them alone. Uh, I have them in right now with the uh, the Harlequin Rasbora. So that's a nice red fish. Uh, that could work out pretty well. So th those would be some that I would consider. But yeah, the chilies would be chilies, dwarfs, and miras would all be too small. Mira slash Phoenix Rasbora. They're just too tiny. They're a tiny little fish. Uh, let's see, Ciche has some pretty good small filters that are self-priming, cool. And the Ciche is, I believe, also, the, that's the Seachem brand too. Uh, Ciche Micra is what I used. Okay, that's cool. Is that, so Natani, is that a, um, a self-priming filter or is that a one that you have to fill up the back first? Just curious. Chris says, 40 years ago, white clouds were considered the hardiest of the smaller species. Do they still have that claim to fame? Hardy, that's a great question. I like that question. White clouds were the, considered the hardiest of the smaller species. Do they still have that claim? They got to be up there. I mean, we've got right, white clouds right here in this tank. No, sorry, this one over here. Uh, they are very hardy. We put them in all kinds of different tanks. We had them out in the pond. They bred like crazy. We brought them in like, what am I going to do with all these white clouds? We kind of spread them throughout the fish room. They don't seem to care in terms of fish tank location. I mean, the water parameters for us, we got harder water with a higher pH. They, uh, they don't really need a heater, so that's an advantage, you know, as long as your house is not freezing cold. So that's pretty cool. They survived, excuse me, they survived out in the pond, and that pond would get warm at times during the summer. Is there a hardier fish, small fish right now, than the white cloud? I don't know. I, 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 I'm thinking of other fish that have been hardy for us, and that's the brilliant green rasbora. That's always been a, a mostly extremely hardy fish for us. I think they gotta still be at the top, right? Because a lot of these other fish that used to be common, that used to be like great beginner fish, there's so many inbred genetics issues now. I'm thinking like all your live bears, your guppies, you buy them at the pet store. You know, you, zebra daniels, I have horrible luck with them. Horrible luck with zebra daniels. I cannot keep them alive. I always get these groups thinking, oh, well, this is going to be great. And they never make it for me. I think that's another one where there's so much inbreeding with those fish that they're not as hardy as they used to be. And maybe it's just me, but I just, I do not find them... To, the, the, the zebra daniels now the giant daniel different story that's an, but that's not a small fish uh they have been pretty good but the zebra daniels i'm has anybody else had that problem has anybody else had the problem with the zebra daniels where you get them you always hear oh great beginner fish and they're going to be awesome and then you get them in and it's like wow these did not last nearly as long as i thought they were going to and that's just what's happened for me 
Jerry says, I have a four foot tank and ordered Trophius. Lelupi and Ventralis will be scared with stacked lava. Oh, will be escaped with stacked lava rock. Cool. That'll be nice. Some Lake Tanganyikan fun. And the Ventralis will be awesome because that'll be like your kind of like an open water fish and kind of like that feather fin look. Love it. Okay, let me see here. We'll do a couple more. We'll do a few more questions. We've got a little bit of time still. Crystal says, want to stack my 20 gallon tanks but do not have the energy to build shelving. Watched your video on the wire shelving that holds 350 pounds per shelf. Is it still a good option? We have four of them in our fish room and that's what they do. They hold 20 gallon. All of those shelves right now are holding. Well, now we've got two in, in um, they're, they're currently up. The other two we obviously took down with the Nano Nook. But when we had the Nano Nook, one of them was holding 14 bow front and two 20s on the second and third on the bottom shelf. And then the ones that we have right now, we have a 12 long, and then two 20 longs on the middle and bottom shelf. And then the, on the other side, we have a standard 20 at the top. I, I would really prefer to put a, I'm going to change that out to a 20 long. And then it's basically three 20 gallon tanks. Haven't had a, no issues. Uh, the nice thing is places like Lowe's and Home Depot and Menards, they sell other types of shelving too that are more like the steel where they kind of click into place and they hold even more weight. You just want to make sure that when you're looking at these shelves, whatever they're using as a shelf is actually running the entire length and width of the shelving unit. So some of these things where you have metal frame, but then there's just a piece of wood. And that I wouldn't use, and that, that's not what these ones are. They're the wire type, and then I would just put a piece of plywood over it just to kind of make sure that it's nice and level. But some of those shelving units, unless the frame is resting on the metal, it's probably not a good idea because just be careful with some of those wood top shelves where the frame is metal, but then the center, there's nothing supporting it except for wood. And when wood gets wet, it gets weak, and then eventually bad things can happen there. So, But I still like those ones. I did a video on them. Novazan, thank you so much for the super chat. Can you safely travel with fish three-ish hours going to Aquashella from Tampa? Thanks again. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let me give you a, a really good example. We do the Quad City Swap. Now, we live in the Chicagoland area. The Quad City Swap is in Davenport, Iowa. Just the drive alone is two hours. We start bagging fish sometime around 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning. We leave here usually by around 8.30, 8, 8.30 at the latest. So already some of the fish have been in a bag from let's say four o'clock in the morning until at least eight o'clock. So that's four hours already sitting in the bag in a tote. Then we have a two hour drive to the Quad City Swap. So we're there by 10. So now that's been six hours in a bag. And then by the time the swap starts at noon, now it's been eight hours. People get their fish, they go home. By the time they get home, maybe those fish have been in a bag for 10 to 12 hours and we get almost no losses, right? And we get lots and lots and lots and lots of return customers. Now, that being said, here's what we do to prepare for that. One, we don't feed the fish the day before, okay? So the reason for that is so if the swap is on a Sunday, we don't feed them at all on Saturday. Maybe they get a little bit Friday night, so they haven't eaten much on Friday night and all day Saturday. And so what that's doing is it's kind of clearing out their system so they're not producing as much waste. So what we don't want is to show up and have a bunch of fish waste in the bag that's starting to rot and cause potential ammonia spikes. So that's the first thing we do. The second thing is I have fresh treated water that's got air stones running in big totes. And so I set up some big 37 gallon totes. I fill them with water, dechlorinate it, run an air stone in there the night before so they have fresh water where there's no ammonia, no nitrite, no nitrate. And then of course, uh, we bag them up that morning and then they go. Now there are lots of people at those swaps that actually bag their fish the day before. And then they sell them at the swap the next day. I don't wanna do that. But so to answer your question, three hours, not a big deal, not a big deal. Uh, the big thing, and even in Tampa, you don't even really have to worry about temperatures because it's gonna be nice there. So you don't have to worry about it. The fish bag is getting too cold. Grow and Clip says, back in the day when I was 12, 75 now, my zebra lived for about two years, were very hardy for me back then. Yeah, I used to keep them as kids, the zebra Daniels. I would keep them as kids and, and as a kid and never a problem. 
And now it's just, my gosh, I cannot keep those things alive. It's very frustrating. Priscilla and candy cane tetras are nice. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, basically the same fish with different colors. I agree. So the Priscilla tetras got a little bit more yellowish, a little bit of red, a little bit of black. The candy cane tetras, a little bit more reddish pink. Have them both. I've done species profiles on both. Had them, have them both in the fish room. Love them. They're awesome. Uh, let me see. Tank Alpha. Terrace tanks are friends. Maybe I'll put them in my 75 gallon. All right. So we're talking about Odessa barbs. That's a cool fish. Dakota, what would what would good tank mates be for an electric blue car, Severns, Geophagus, and Angelfish? Please, I would really appreciate the answer. Well, you're about to get one. Again, it depends on the size of the tank. I'm going to assume with that mix, I've got at least a 75 gallon, or at some point we're going to be moving up, maybe even a six foot tank, because electric blue car, maybe six inches, the Severum will get six, seven inches long, but it's a very big, tall bodied fish. Depending on the geophagus you have, they can get close to 10 inches. Top post a little bit smaller. Angelfish, they can get big. So let's assume you've got a pretty big tank. Let's also assume at this point that we're we're reaching the limit in terms of our cichlid stocking. It's a great mix, by the way. So your electric blue car, your severums, your geophagus, your angelfish, you'll have a tank boss in there, but none of them are usually overly aggressive. And so now what I would be looking for would be fish that are gonna be more like schooling, more community type fish. And they're going to have to be big enough so that your severums and your geophagus won't eat them because those are be, those would be the two. They're not going to go out of their way to eat fish, but any fish that's tiny could become fish food. So now I'm looking for a schooling type fish. I'm also looking for something that's not going to be fin nippy because the last thing you want with your geophagus is to have those beautiful trailers nipped off. And depending on whether or not your angel fish is a veil tail, you want to protect that one as well because they can be prone to fin nipping. So that means most likely a lot of the barbs are not in play. However, one barb that comes to mind that might be is the snakeskin barb. It is one of my absolute favorite barbs because they, to me, they look better than tiger barbs. They stay a little bit smaller and they are they're much more gentle, much more, not quite as crazy. So the snakeskin barb would be a nice one, like a nice big group of 15 or 20 if you've got the tank size that I think you have with those fish. Other fish that would be nice, that would be relatively large, uh, the filamentosis barb. I know that I said I would stay away from a lot of barbs, and now I'm giving you a couple. If you had a nice big tank, at least a six-foot tank, the mascara barb is absolutely a stunning-looking fish. So filament barb, the mas mascara barb are two really awesome-looking fish. If you've got like a two-ton or larger, now you're looking at maybe some of the larger like tinfoil barbs or something. If you're like eight foot tank, there's albino tinfoil barbs that are, or I don't know if they're calling them albino. I guess they are. Yeah, and there's a, there's a platinum tinfoil barb that's pretty stinking cool. What else could we do as a larger? Uh, Congo Tetras could certainly, like as long as they're not too small, right? If you're not buying them really small, the Congo Tetras in a large size tank, that would be pretty awesome as well. So you've definitely got some, some things and then of course if you're looking for bottom dwellers a lot of your loaches right your clown loaches your red tail botias might look pretty cool some of the syncrosis can be pretty cool i did a species profile on the bird mori love that fish very awesome i'm in c what's up uh daniels are a little spaz fish yeah they are always 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 on the move so if you like fish on the move definitely Vinny said, oh, that's a good question. Are there any tank mates for common goldfish? I have a 75 with a couple commons. Um, so the thing with a goldfish is most likely you're trying to keep it in an unheated tank. So that's going to that's gonna be something to consider. Right now, I showed the members this like last week or the week before. My goldfish, my fancy goldfish are in some, they're in a 75 with, I just had to move a bunch of fish from another 75 in there. And right now they're all getting along just fine. Not a single one of them would I recommend long term. What I have done with the common goldfish in this, and when I've had those fish before, is I did add some bristlenose plecos because they can go down in the upper 60s. They're fine. The thing that you always have to wonder about with the bristlenose are they going to start to attack the slime coat of fish? I didn't find that to be the case. So those were something that I did, but I, I generally just kept the goldfish by themselves only because. Like we mentioned earlier, sometimes you start getting some feeding issues where the goldfish are just, they're just bull in a china shop. They're just eating all the food. And sometimes the food competition can be a little bit rough. A lot of your other cooler water fish sometimes are going to be too small, like your white clouds. And um, 
again, your common goldfish get pretty big. Maybe, maybe, maybe some of your larger Gudeids might work, but they would have to be pretty close to full grown. Uh, that could be an option. So just look up Gudeids. That might be something. But yeah, I, I think you're somewhat limited, somewhat limited there. And I know I'm forgetting a few. I mean, some people will try to keep their common goldfish with some of like the natural species in the Midwest, like your pumpkin seeds and your your bluegills. But I generally don't think that's a great idea because they can be, they're, they're cichlid-like in their behavior and they can be very fin nippy. So that's kind of how I would roll. But they're so pretty. Sometimes they're just best off on their own. All right, everybody. It is pretty much exactly the time where we usually end this bad boy. And I think we are going to go ahead and call it a night because it's getting to be a little bit on the later side. So uh, yeah, really appreciate you being here. Thank you to our moderators for hanging out with us tonight. Thank you for everybody and the super chats and, and the uh, memberships that were gifted. That's pretty awesome. Glad you're here. And for all the great questions, you guys had some good questions tonight. Love that. So if I didn't get a chance to answer your question tonight, please come back next week. Make a list of things you want to have answered. And we'll try to answer as many questions as we can next week because we'll be back. Same bad time, same bad channel next Wednesday. Have a great week and we will see you next week. Bye-bye, everybody. Hit some buttons here.